Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this new lecture for uh, the MTV Summer School. Uh, my name is Chris. And I'm going to present today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so I'm going to be talking today about activation analysis. Uh, again, my name is Chris, and I'm a fourth year PhD student here at the University of Michigan. And uh, I've included my email address here, just so if we have any questions that maybe I can't answer at the end of the presentation, you can always shoot me an email uh, and we, I can get in contact with someone uh, who can help us out. So we go ahead and start with some of the basics. Um, you remember from week one, uh, Mike had discussed some neutron interactions. And some of the major ones included transmutation, capture, and fission. Uh, in the case of, uh, of what we're looking at, we're mostly going to rely on these capture reactions or transmutation reactions that emit some accompanying gamma rays. Some example reactions I've shown color coded in the lower right. So uh, like an example of transmutation would be neutron capture by boron 10, uh, which will create uh, helium uh, 42, like alpha particle, and also uh, lithium. Uh, an example of a capture would be chromium 50, which captures a neutron, becomes chromium 51, and then emits a gamma ray. And there's, of course, there's fission. Uh, this is just one example of a fission reaction. Um, but we're mostly relying on these capture and transmutation reactions. Um, so a good example shown on the upper right is a bromine 81 activation. So in this case, a neutron is absorbed by bromine 81. It becomes bromine 82 and is in an excited state. It's then going to emit some prompt gamma rays. Uh, and then to, uh, to transition to its ground state, and then undergo, because that is a radioactive element, it will undergo a beta emission to become krypton-82, which is then an excited state, emitting further uh, gamma rays. Uh, so then returns to its that ground state. So in, in the context of this work, we'll mostly be looking for these decay gamma rays that come after the decay of the, uh, the activation product. So again, starting with bromine-81, but we're going to detect the decay gamma rays that accompany the bromine 82 decay. Uh, and this is something that can be quite powerful because these gamma rays are also very specific to the isotope. Uh, so you can have a very good idea if you're measuring a very specific energy that that comes, you'd be very confident that, that comes from a specific isotope, not even just element. So how might we apply this? Uh, here I have the just the actual definition from the IAEA's website. And they say neutron activation analysis is a method for the qualitative and quantitative determination of elements based on the measurement of characteristic radiation from radionuclides formed by radiating materials uh, by neutrons. And I just highlighted a few key phrases here to help us out. For example, in the blue, I said quantitative determination of elements. So this is about uh, analyzing samples of maybe unknown elements, unknown isotopes, and we want to know what is inside that sample. Uh, in green, I said measurement of char characteristic radiation. Again, that ties back to those gamma rays that are uh, very specific to the isotopes that create them or emit them. Um, in orange, I said by radiating materials by neutrons, just to signal that we need to induce these reactions using a suitable neutron source. And also keep in mind this definition is about characterizing a sample, but you can sort of invert this problem. You can use a well-characterized sample that you know, uh, you know its physical properties very well and, and uh, expose it to an unknown neutron flux to get the, the flux term. And that's an example we'll do later uh, in this slide set. So some examples and uh, challenges for this process, because there's always going to be uh, basically some pros and cons. Um, some of the advantages, uh, we're relying again on this characteristic radiation that helps us with our confidence to, um, of knowing that we're looking at a very specific element or reaction product. Um, and a, a major point as well is that these uh, activation foils that we're going to use uh, can handle intense environments. For example, if you wanted to put a detector inside a reactor, then it'd be difficult uh, because it, it may be exposed to uh, water, uh, but it also be exposed to large fluxes of photons. And that can either you know, contribute to damage to your equipment or even blinding your detector. So these foils are often picked uh, for their sensitivity to neutron reactions, not to photon interactions. More advantages include that the, these full materials are not necessarily exotic materials that are hard to get. Uh, you'll see that common materials can be like aluminum or iron. Uh, so you know, these can be convenient 
And again, because we're relying on this characteristic radiation and because we can use, in some cases, high fluxes of neutrons, this method of analysis uh, it has very high sensitivity to identify, say, trace elements and trace isotopes in any given sample. That can be quite valuable uh, when you're looking at some unknown sample. So, uh, of course, there's always some challenges. So I listed here just a few. Um, because this is an indirect method of observing a radiation interaction, um, we're going to have to remove that foil and neutron flux and bring it to a counter, another detector, to detect those decay gamma rays. And that means uh, we may lose some information as we transfer that material. Uh, another challenge or idea is that if you're going to characterize an unknown flux, you're going to want a very high purity. So um, if you have other contaminants, uh, that will interfere with your measurements. And another key thing is uh, what detectors required to do this analysis. Uh, an HPGE, like what Nathan had discussed, uh, is very valuable because you might deal with a lot of gamma lines. So move on to the next slide. So what might we, what might we uh, apply this method to? Uh, I list several applications here. Uh, on the upper left, you can use that activation analysis in archaeology. So that term I learned was called provenance determination. So this plot shows um, data that has, a, say, manganese parts per millionth in the x-axis and a percent sodium on the y-axis. And what they did was they took uh, samples of, say, minerals or pottery from known regions within a country um, or continent. And then they analyzed each of those samples using activation analysis uh, and grouped them. So you know that in each one of these ellipses is a uh, specific um, a pottery from a specific area. So in this way, uh, if you characterize enough samples and then someone gives you an unknown piece of pottery from maybe a, uh, some sort of culture, uh, you can then analyze your unknown sample with activation analysis, find out its, say, manganese and sodium uh, composition, put on this plot and have a good idea of where it came from. The same sort of process can be used in geology. So uh, this is a uh, lunar sample, so you can characterize uh, samples from Apollo missions and understand what elements are, are on the are on a, a moon. Uh, the more visible to us uh, as nuclear engineers might be measuring the flux distribution. So again, uh, putting a foil in this intense flux would be much more valuable than uh, putting a detector that may be overwhelmed by all the radiation signals. And there's a few more examples that I could not find great pictures for, but I wanted to list them. You can use this in criminal forensics, for example, looking at bullet samples or hair samples. Environmental sampling, so if you want to find pollution, maybe track uh, mercury in the environment, you can activate those samples and look at the uh, composition. And also nuclear forensics, say if you took, again, environmental samples and wanted to look for uranium in the environment. Or uh, characterize a, if you did find a sample of uranium and you want to know where it was from, maybe you'd be able to do that. So this is a wide application, but it all relies, or it's all employed for this characterization of materials and samples. So we just sort of start from a very, uh, or run through this process very intuitively. We can start at the beginning, or how would you activate elements, or how would you activate your samples? Um, probably the first thing that comes to mind is a reactor. Uh, these are quite useful because they'll create very large neutron fluxes, for example, like 10 to the 12 neutrons per centimeter squared second. Depends on your power level. A lot of times people use uh, research reactors. Uh, so examples would be like the high flux isotope reactor or HIFER at Oak Ridge, which is a picture I've shown here. Um, or the University of Missouri research reactor, which I've shown on the lower right. Uh, in principle, you could use, say, a neutron generator or even isotopic sources of neutrons. But maybe just consider uh, what may be required to produce the same flux that you get from a reactor and then they restrict what, what materials you want to use as your activation medium um, and how long you have to irradiate your samples. So uh, if we decide on a source, we can also discuss what we actually want to activate. So again, I'd mentioned, uh, I said foils a lot. Uh, we generally use very thin foils of metal for these, this activation analysis in the case of, say, characterizing a neutron flux. And you might think uh, that a thick sample would be more useful because you have more atoms to activate. But uh, there's, there's some drawbacks mostly related to if you have a thick sample, you can perturb the neutron flux instant on your foil. So maybe a very thick foil 
uh, you may not be using much of the volume, especially if you have a large cross section. Um, you're also trying to detect those emitted photons. So if you have a thick metal sample, uh, you have to deal with self attenuation of those photons. And again, these, the metals you may use, this is going to depend on your application. Uh, a lot of these materials are listed in the null radiation textbook. So you can see for slow neutrons, relatively common materials, cobalt, copper, silver, there's even gold. And for fast, you would uh, look at materials like magnesium, aluminum, quite common. Uh, iron, nickel, and zinc. So some more details on how you might pick which flow to be used. Uh, you definitely should consider the shape of the cross sections. So I plotted here some data from an NDEF library for two different isotopes. The, the green is dysprosium-164, blue is zinc-64. Uh, and there are two different interactions. So the, the green is for a, an N gamma, so the nucleus will absorb that neutron and emit a gamma. Zinc 64, that's a neutron absorbed, but a, a proton is emitted. You can see already, for example, the uh, N gamma cross section is much higher at these low energies. Uh, the NP sort of turns on at a higher energy that might be more similar to fast neutrons. Uh, and you'll see very similarly, a lot of these, these other reactions may come in at higher energies. Um, but this means you can sort of select your foils to tailor them for different energy sensitivities. Uh, you also consider the magnitude of cross sections. So whereas the previous plot showed just uh, two different reactions from two different elements, I've plotted here several reactions from the same isotope that you could activate. So again, you could have N gamma, you could have uh, N proton, you have uh, an alpha emission or even two neutron emission. And you can see how these all sort of compete with each other. Uh, so that's definitely something you have to consider when you select these materials. Uh, and each one of these reactions could have its own uh, or will have its own gamma ray emission. Um, so you have to consider how to uh, wrap all these details uh, into one number to, to quantify your activation and does point to our need for that uh, high purity germanium detector that has very good energy resolution. We also want to consider that the details of the radioactivity of that foil. For example, if you choose a foil with a short half-life, that means you will not have to irradiate as long to reach a saturation activity. Um, but you may consider in extreme cases, if you're going to have such a strong activity that you'll overwhelm your detector. You could pick a very short half-life. Um, oh, excuse me, you could kick, yeah, you, a short half-life will also cause slow sample movements to have a negative effect. So example, if your element decays very quickly uh, and you take a long time to move it, you're, you're going to miss out on a lot of signal. Another factor is this nature of induced radioactivity. So we really want to rely on those gamma ray emissions. Um, but we, on occasion, have uh, no choice but to use something like electron emissions. Um, but electron spectroscopy is not quite as accurate as gamma spectroscopy. So I've shown two examples you, you may use. Um, so for example, an activation of lithium-7 will get you uh, tritium, which does not decay with a gamma ray, or at least not strong gamma ray. And it has a long half-life, whereas aluminum uh, MP reaction will get you magnesium that does decay with a gamma ray and has a relatively short half-life. Uh, so that's going to have a bearing on how long you have to radiate it. So uh, some other factors that I just put in this miscellaneous slide, again, they're, they're good to know, um, but I could not find some great pictures to put them on their own slides. Um, Magnitude of cross-section is important. Again, increasing your cross-section will lower your radiation time because that's going to have an effect on your activation rate. Purity and contaminants, as I already had mentioned, uh, if you have a higher purity, that's uh, going to make it easier for you to analyze. Um, more contaminants will correspond to even more gamma ray peaks that you'll have to look at or worry about competition or interference. Um, and also consider that contaminants could have extremely high uh, emission rates. Uh, so that will cause complications for your detector dead time. Last thing I listened to here was physical properties. Um, we've all been talking about foils throughout this presentation. And in general, uh, it seems that people do use solid mediums. But the uh, 
null detection book does mention that liquid and gaseous forms could be used, but they're generally impractical. Imagine having to encapsulate some liquid or gaseous medium to then activate. And then again, it has to survive whatever environment you're going to put it in. So that can cause some issues. So through all this, imagine we discussed our source of, of neutrons, we discussed our materials, but we can circle back again to discuss uh, how we're going to detect all those gamma rays. Um, the HPG detectors are ideal for this case, uh, again, because they have great energy resolution. If you remember from Nathan's talk yesterday, or yeah, um, they are semiconductors, they have low band gap, which helps you with your energy resolution, but they do require cooling. Um, which can make this uh, slightly more complicated to use. Now in the measurement space, this helps us out with our unknown samples. Again, uh, you can see all these different peaks as opposed to uh, using, say, a sodium iodide, which may cause overlapping of peaks and make it very difficult for you to interpret results. And on the right, I've just shown some various pictures of some uh, HPG detectors. You can see all these uh, dewars that will hold the liquid nitrogen to keep them cold enough. I see one uh, one message in the chat about some clarification on the foils. This is good to answer now. Uh, the, the foils are the neutron source that you use to bombard the sample. Um, no, so I should clarify, the foils are the samples we put in the neutron flux. The neutron flux activates the, uh, the foil, so we're making that foil radioactive, and then that foil is going to decay. And so we use our detectors to detect the decay products from the foil. So I hope that helps uh, clarify that answer. So um, one related thing to this before we move on to some examples is uh, something called an activation counter. Um, this sort of gets around the requirement that you need to move a foil to count it. Um, what you can do is layer some foils that have these activation cross sections right next to a large detector. So the example on the right are uh, silver foils layered with plastic scintillator. It might be difficult to see, but you can see these black and white lines. And uh, in the same way, you can also put moderator about around these detectors. Um, and that means uh, that will lower the energy of the neutrons, get them to uh, energies that will get you to those, uh, say, N gamma cross sections that are much higher at, at thermal energies. So I can help you out get, getting a good activation, especially considering fast neutron fluxes can be hard to, uh, hard to get appreciable activation. And again, because they're right next to the detector, you don't have to move them. Um, and because you have a basically immediate readout from your detector, uh, you can also choose foils with very short half-lives. So uh, in the plot on the lower right, these are, this is a count, uh, count rate uh, for as, as you change time after a pulse of neutrons near this detector. So you imagine the neutron flux hits the foils, the foils activate and then decay, and the decay products, say get the gamma rays, uh, are detected by this plastic scintillator. Uh, so you can look, even within the short time period, so 600 seconds, 10 minutes, you can see how this count, uh, these counts change with time. And that's due to the actual decay of, in this case, the silver foils. So there's a very short-lived uh, state of the, of the activated silver that decays with half-life in about 24 seconds. Uh, you see a 2.4 minute activity that also decays, and you have to plot some background to compare this to. Uh, 10 minutes, again, may, might be compared uh, or considered relatively short uh, to some other measurements. Okay. Another uh, related reaction is, uh, or related application is called prompt gamma ray neutron activation analysis. This is a pretty special case related to active interrogation that we'll talk about later uh, in this lecture series. Uh, the important point is that we're relying on this neutron capture uh, for specific elements like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. These HCNO elements can indicate presence of contraband. So here's like a, from literature, uh, there's, you can see concentrations in explosives or, or illicit drugs. But of course, it's in plenty of benign materials, uh, things like nylon, paper. Uh, so maybe if you compare these ratios, 
you have a good idea of uh, what might be in a package and maybe those ratios can tell you whether you're looking at some illicit material. Uh, and just to give an idea of how these energies change, uh, I show this, this plot uh, on the X, there's energy of the emitted gamma rays and MeV on the Y axis, cross section and barns for the reaction. And each of these markers is for a different element. So for example, uh, hydrogen has a 2.2 MeV emission. Uh, you can see all these line, all these uh, emissions from nitrogen, carbon in the pink, and also uh, oxygen, orange. You imagine all these, all these signals will eventually um, interfere with each other in your detector, and that'll be part of your analysis. Um, okay, so after discussing some of these applications, we can do a sort of simple example. I won't go too deep into the math, but this should give you a good overview. I think I see a few questions in chat that are uh, seem pretty relevant. Um, let's see. Uh, one percent question foils are used for determining the neutron flux that's correct uh, this example will be specifically um, a hypothetical neutron or sorry a hypothetical foil that we're going to uh, expose to a neutron flux so um, yeah so we're starting out just with activation um, the general equation for an activation rate is r equals uh, flux times activation cross section times foil volume so in this example, uh, we say we don't know the neutron flux. Um, so we're going to use a well-characterized sample. So an activation cross-section, remember that from the neutron, um, neutron lecture. And then a foil volume. You know, people usually manufacture these foils with very high precision, so you'll have a good idea of all the dimensions and therefore a good idea of the volume. And so uh, doing these calculations, you'll get an activation rate that is on a per second basis. But some important points here before we move on is that this is a sort of integrated method. So we have to assume that the flux is constant. Um, we will not be able to tell a sort of time dependent neutron flux. So we need to make sure that for all our counting experiments that we keep that neutron flux as constant as possible for this analysis to work. And also keep in mind this, this slide so far just covers the creation of elements, uh, or sorry, the activation of the sample. Uh, and since we're making radioactive nuclei, as we activate them, they're going to be decaying. So, um, so now we need to talk about how the decay affects your activation. Um, so this is sort of a cutout plot from the Null book. Uh, you can imagine as we're irradiating a sample, uh, we're on this green curve, uh, and it's described by a differential equation. There is a question in chat that says, why, why should low cross-section cause high radiation time? Okay, so maybe that's good to discuss now. A, high, a low cross-section, and as Chris had mentioned, uh, less chance of capture, you have to radiate longer. Yes, that's correct. If you, if you consider that this sigma here for activation cross-section is the product of number density and microscopic cross-section, uh, you see the activation rate is directly related to that cross-section you will have to activate it, or you will have to irradiate it longer to get uh, activation. So uh, quickly jumping back to this, we have a differential equation. The important units to know here include this number of nuclei, n, your activation rate that we discussed on the previous plot, uh, slide, and also decay constant. Uh, so decay constant you can find from um, various online sources. Um, you can calculate from half-life or vice versa as well. So starting with differential equation, again, I'm you know, not really focused in on the math for this, um, but you just start by assuming that your initial radioactive nuclei population is zero, which is usually a safe assumption, and really you'd, you'd want that to be the case before you start irradiating. And then you can solve through your usual methods um, and remove the foil at what is called time zero. So you irradiate, you, the activity is increasing, it will asymptotically reach some saturation activity, um, but then when you remove it, it'll be at time zero. After you remove it, there's no more creation of those uh, activation products, so uh, it becomes a decay only problem. So uh, first it'll take us some time to start counting. So you can imagine this red curve, 
uh, that's when the sample is decaying, but we're not getting any information from that. It's just say in our calipers or, or forceps as we move to our counting station. And then we can count between time one and time two, which I've shown in blue on this plot. Um, and we just sort of uh, just do a total count between these two, these two time bands and it's related to an integral. Um, and during this time, we're going to really observe what are called gross counts, which will be a combination of decays from the sample and also background counts. So um, you might consider when you do this analysis, you want to pick an area that has a low background. So if you're at a reactor, you would not want to start counting uh, your foil right next to the reactor. Uh, you may want to take it somewhere in a well shielded area, maybe somewhere underground, um, somewhere with good shielding. So you do not have high background rates. This efficiency factor comes into play. Uh, it's just part of this equation. Um, can become more, um, you guys get some better intuition as we move further through the lecture series. Uh, and then we can just use uh, the equations, like in this case, this is an example from the null book, to solve for your activity at time zero. So we don't know the activity at time zero, but, um, but we can use uh, this counting equation between our two time, our time start and time stop. We can look at our observed counts, our background counts, uh, and solve for this saturation activity. And then with that act saturation activity, we plug that back into the first equation we started with, um, rearrange to solve for flux, and that's what we solve. So, so you can imagine this case again, we did not know the neutron flux, but we knew the sample well, and we just ran through uh, an activation process, we ran through a counting uh, process after we removed the foil from the, from the uh, neutron flux, and then we used some simple math to uh, solve for that flux. And again, looking at our units, activity divided by the cross section and the volume will get us uh, common units for flux, uh, inverse center, uh, centimeter squared seconds. So um, that's sort of like the easiest example for us as nuclear engineers. And you can sort of imagine doing this process for multiple, say, axial locations in a nuclear reactor. And that may give you a flux distribution. Um, again, this is something that maybe a detector could not do based on uh, the intensity of the reactor, uh, reactor power, or uh, maybe you don't want to keep your reactor in water for this such an experiment. So that's sort of the end of that uh, example. And like usual, I'll just, I include some community resources to talk about this uh, this process. There is links to like an NRC uh, PowerPoint set that discusses the same process in uh, some broad strokes. There's the USGS, which uh, has a nice website discussing how they do neutron activation analysis. And I also included um, a link to a Brookhaven National Laboratory site, which has information for all the uh, decay constants and half-lives, which I would use to, to do some of these calculations. And of course, textbooks as well. I owe a lot of this slide set to the NOL radiation detection measurement book. You may find that that influences a lot of these lectures. Um, it's just a very valuable tool for us. Um, and a lot of the plots are pulled from there. And I also include one other uh, textbook that I found online that you guys can always link to. So we're going to try to wrap up quickly with this summary slide. Again, this is a process that you can use to either characterize an unknown sample. In that case, you'll want to have a well-characterized neutron source. You follow the general steps here, you know, activating it, moving it to a detector, counting, and then also then having to compare those gamma peaks to a library. But you can also use it to characterize an unknown neutron source. Um, again, you want to start, in this case, with a well-characterized sample, something that you know the purity of and the dimensions of to a high degree. Um, you'll activate it, move it to your detector, count again. Um, you'll have to calculate that saturation activity, just like the equation, excuse me, the example we went through, uh, and that'll give you that flux. So, of course, visually, I include this plot because it's the, uh, the important visual for this uh, and list very briefly, if I could drive this home. The major advantages are high sensitivity to trace isotopes or elements, um, and the fact that you can detect these neutron interactions without having to worry about photon signals interfering, like if you had a detector in an intense photon field. Uh, and of course, always consider the challenges, um, the need for an appropriate neutron source to get the activation uh, that is significant for counting, and also the need that you 
move your sample quickly to minimize your signal loss. So, uh, so thanks for listening. Uh, I can go through some questions now. So I might just scroll back through chat. Let's see, I have one question maybe near the start. They'd asked, in the archaeology example, can you discuss a few outliers? Are there conditions where the technique fails? Hmm. So I can try to navigate back. That's all the way out. It's up at the front. I'm not a expert in archaeology and say like the geology and how, how minerals may disperse themselves. So I do not have a quick answer for that. Um, but yeah, you can see there are definitely some outliers. And that's probably up to the researcher that interprets the results. Um, this paper, this link, um, this A reference, it, it is in a um, citation in the notes of this slide. So if you download this, this slide set, you can look at, take a look at that paper and I'm sure that they discuss their methodology for determining what is an outlier and what is not. But that's a good question. Try to scroll through more of this. I see a message from uh, uh, Dr. Goldston says, um, where is your favorite online resource to get gamma spectra for activated elements? Hmm. So I know there is an INL, Idaho National Lab catalog, that has basically measured gamma spectra for many isotopes. Um, I think some of them are with germanium lithium detectors, which may be similar to high purity germanium. There's also in that same site um, a version with sodium iodide. But those have some good uh, measured spectra. Um, that Brookhaven National Lab resource, the NNDC, will also list um, the uh, emission gamma lines from each of those decays. So you can see the energies of their decays and you can see their um, abundance. So for example, a, a specific decay may only emit um, a certain energy 20% of the time, 50% of the time, something like that. You can see all that data there. There's also an online resource from the IAEA that they have a prompt gamma activation analysis library, and those will list tabular or in table form and also plot uh, that same sort of data with uh, cross sections, energies, and also um, sort of branching ratios for each of those values. more through here. Can we estimate the energy of neutrons from the gamma ray energy spectrum from the foil? Mm. So I, I guess insofar as um, the gamma ray spectrum will again point to the interactions that occurred. So maybe I should go to the, the cross section slide. Yeah, so for example, what might be the better example here? Let's say two different elements. Um, both, if you put foils of these compositions in your neutron flux, um, or maybe if for some reason you had both of these materials in the same foil, you would see, again, the specific gamma rays associated with these decay products. So you would see gamma ray lines from your copper 64 decay which is caused by this interaction, which has no cross-section below, um, I don't know, I'm uh, trying to think here. Yeah, below the, like in the slow region of neutrons. If you see all the gamma rays from a, um, this DY165 decay, um, you can be sure that was caused by one of these reactions. You can compare these um, gamma ray emissions to understand maybe the concentration of the element, which tells you uh, about the energy spectra. There's also a method where you can use the same foil, um, but use a cadmium cover. Um, cadmium uh, has a high cross-section for 
uh, slow neutrons below 0.5 eV. Um, and so you can compare a cadmium ratio to know um, maybe the ratio of, of thermal neutrons or slow neutrons versus the uh, resonance or higher energy neutrons that are in your, uh, your flux. Question, how to calculate net count rate uncertainty in gamma, way, gamma ray spectro spectrometry technique? So usually when we do spectroscopy, and I guess you'll hear in some, probably in some later presentations, we usually assume uh, the Poisson uh, statistics. So you have to account for the, like say the uncertainty in a count is related to its square root. Um, but you also have to account for the background count rate, uh, and that is uh, square root of the sum of the squares of those counts. Um, we'll probably discuss that as we get into more of the detector lectures, and that'll be a good resource uh, for you guys to see. Another comment uh, for archaeology, the technique may fail if the pottery shards have been exposed to significant hydration. For example, if the samples were found in a stream, as there would be exchange between the material and the water. Um, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not an expert at that, at uh, the archaeology field. Um, that's a good point. Thanks for, thanks for posting that. Uh, would you move your sample foil or a neutron source after activation to take your measurements? So, that's a good question. Um, you know, most of the time, if you're using a reactor, of course, you, you're not going to move the reactor. Um, so in that case, you have to move your foils. Um, in other cases, if you had, say, a neutron generator or an isotopic source, sure, you, it'd be much easier to move the isotopic source. But I would think to keep your background low at your counting station, you probably have shielding. And that probably means um, shielding that can be quite heavy. So it's going to be much simpler um, for you to move your activation foil to your counting station uh, and just leave the neutron source where it is. And that'll also help too if you want to um, do repeated measurements and make sure that your foil is seeing the same flux at each measurement. Uh, Dr. Colson says put the, uh, put the links in the notes. Yeah, I can add some more of the links um, that I've mentioned, like the PGAA. Uh, database from IEA, I can put those in the notes as well. Uh, maybe put an updated version of the slide set today or tomorrow. Uh, see a new post. Uh, can you talk about the sample preparation for samples that are not metal foils, like pottery or soil samples? Hmm. So I had not seen um, much discussion on that sample preparation. Um, I would imagine maybe for like soil, Again, you may only need a small sample um, because you don't want to, uh, like you're using a thicker sample, we discussed how that may affect your spectra. Um, pottery, of course, if someone, if an archeologist says, here's a, here's a pottery from uh, a culture that doesn't exist, of course, you don't wanna do any destructive analysis of it. So I'd have to think more, maybe look up a few examples um, of how you might prepare uh, pottery or archeological samples. Of course, we don't, we don't want to damage that when we do this technique. Um, it is considered non-destructive in that way, um, but it, it's probably not acceptable to chip off like maybe pieces of paint or something from the pottery to do your analysis. I'll look at that. How is the decay constant lambda determined? Yeah, so that was probably, <laughs> That's not really part of the slide set. Um, those are all tabulated online. So, you know, it's really to the half-life. So when people characterized all these radioactive elements, um, they had to do these measurements to characterize the rate at which they decayed. Um, so again, you, you can find all that data on either that uh, National Nuclear, da Nuclear Data Center, which is at Brookhaven. Um, there are uh, plenty of other sources as well that I think you can find them in. But thanks, that is, that's a good question to verify or uh, clarify for everyone. That is data that you generally get from somebody else's data library. Okay. Uh, 
I think. It's like questions have sort of slowed down. Um, again, if, if I've missed anything or maybe if I, if I somehow missed your question, feel free to email me. My email is at that title slide. Um, and again, um, I'll, I'll work to put in some new links in the notes section and also upload a new version of this to the Google Drive. So, so probably maybe by the end of the week, if you guys wanna look at more of these, uh, these links I've provided, those will be in this slide set.